Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Erickson, uh, and I am the program manager for the Detroit Neighborhood Entrepreneurs Project, which is a project of the Center on Finance, Law and Policy, uh, which is bringing you this talk today. Uh, the Detroit Neighborhood Entrepreneurs Project has the mission to bring together small businesses with University of Michigan students, faculty, and staff to solve business owners' legal, financial, marketing, operational, and design challenges. And we are duly focused on Detroit neighborhoods and student learning. Uh, we work across the University of Michigan and across Detroit. Uh, this semester, we are working with 47 teams of Uni University of Michigan students um, who are enrolled in courses across the university uh, working on projects with Detroit business owners. Uh, a brief story about me that I think is relevant to this talk today. When I graduated from college, I worked for an institution-based community uh, organizing effort in Central Florida for an organization called Faith in Action. In that role, I worked with others to fight, mostly unsuccessfully, for a more compassionate and effective foreclosure assistance response from the federal government and the Florida state government. And I also worked, again unsuccessfully, for reform to the payday lending industry. So for those of you who are uh, a little bit familiar with Dr. Friedlein's work, you can imagine that I personally am very interested in her talk today. Uh, Dr. Terry Friedlein is an associate professor at the School of Social Work, faculty director within the Center on Assets, Education and Inclusion, and research fellow at New America in Washington, DC. She conducts research to envision, redefine, and move financial and economic justice, particularly for and with individuals and groups traditionally excluded from and marginalized by the financial system. Her research covers areas such as access to the financial system and participation in today's economy and basic financial products like checking and savings accounts and their importance for conducting a wide range of transactions. Dr. Friedlein has studied access to the financial system through a basic bank or savings account as a gateway to, into the economic world, an alternative to debt for achieving economic goals, and an opportunity for acquiring and accumulating wealth. Her most recent research, Mapping Financial Opportunity, investigates the financial system from a macro perspective and the racialized ways that banks, credit unions, and payday lenders invest in communities. Before entering academia, she worked for several years as a clinical social worker in the juvenile justice system. In her latest book, which is quite good, uh, Banking on a Revolution, Why Financial Technology Won't Save a Broken System, Professor Friedlein calls attention to systemic issues in society and the economy. Rather than separately dissecting issues, Professor Friedlein groups systemic issues under the term financialized racial neoliberal capitalism. Institutions and philosophies are not uh, race and gender blind, she argues, and then demonstrate, demonstrates how racism and patriarchy have infected the world in which we live. So with that introduction, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Terry Friedlein. Uh, if you do have questions, you can message them to me privately, uh, and I hope we have some time at the end uh, for a Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Friedlein. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today um, and for you to join me on this afternoon. Thank you, Justin, for that kind um, introduction. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't uh, get to uh, see the successes that our work um, realizes. So um, thanks for sharing about your work. And I'm sure that there are seeds there um, that will grow in the future. Uh, so I have, you know, immense gratitude um, for the Center on Finance, Law and Policy for inviting me to give this talk. Um, thank you to everyone working behind the scenes to make this possible and for those who are joining this afternoon. Um, you know, the process of writing a book, um, you know, often isn't solitary. So um, I have benefited you know, from a lot of support in thinking through ideas um, and learning with others, um, several who are on the call. Um, this afternoon. And so I, I won't give kind of individual thanks, um, but do appreciate, you know, that, that support and that collective thinking. Um, so I'm going to begin the book, uh, or begin the talk, like I begin the book, um, by situating us in some historical contexts that have contemporary relevance. Um, and, and let me give a brief agenda of how I'll move forward. So I'm going to talk through the origins of banks, or, you know, banks as an origin story. Uh, what that means for fintech and, and the subtitle of the book is, you know, fintech won't save a broken system and, and 
uh, and what that means. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, really three chapters of the book. One um, that focuses on student loans, including financialization and the tyranny of bootstraps, corporate landlords and the climate crisis, and then conclude with a conversation about, you know, how people-led movements are, are shifting power and are bringing revolution to the financial system in, in some pretty important and exciting ways. Um, I also want to make a few notes on accessibility. So this might also be useful if you're joining by phone today. So I'm a white woman with brown hair. Um, I have on a blue shirt. I'm sitting in a room that um, overall is pretty empty behind me. There are three pictures framed on the walls. Um, there's some books on a mid-height bookshelf in the background, um, including my book. Um, and those things are visible behind me. Um, I'm going to be sharing PowerPoint slides throughout, and there are a number of images on those slides. My remarks are going to talk through the content of these slides, um, though for accessibility purposes, I'm happy to make available copies of my slides that include written caption descriptions for the images. All right, so banks as an origin story. Our financial system, like the United States, is, is rooted in histories of white racial violence. Um, one of the earliest periods of violence includes the genocide of indigenous peoples. Um, and Lely Long Soldier has a poem that's titled 38 that tells the, the story of 38 Dakota men. Um, I don't write about this in the book, but I want to share um, as part of context for this conversation today. And I'd like to thank Hilary Watson and, and um, uh, who first shared this poem with me. So 38 Dakota men were mass executed by hanging under the orders of President Lincoln in 1862. Um, and this was in retaliation for what's known as the Sioux Uprising. Uh, so um, we must remind ourselves of and, and acknowledge this history um, because it is still living with us, including the acknowledgement that the University of Michigan is located on the ancestral lands of the Nishwi, Ishkadoan, and Anishinaabeg, the Three Fires people, who are the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations. Um, indigenous peoples experience the ongoing colonization of their ancestral lands. Um, after the Dakota people's land was stolen, they starved. And there was a white trader named Andrew Merrick um, who refused to lend to the Dakota and to extend credit for them um, you know, to purchase food. So if you were wondering kind of where is the connection to banks and finance, uh, you know, this, this white trader refused to extend credit um, in this case. And he's known for this callous saying, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. Uh, since people who are starved cannot live, the Dakota peoples fought back. Settlers and traders were killed, including Merrick. Um, and in response to the Sioux uprising, uh, Lincoln ordered the mass execution of, of 38 Dakota men, which happened uh, just after the Christian holiday of Christmas on December 26, 1862. Um, notably, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation just a few days later, declaring that enslaved people should be freed. And so another period of violence um, was slavery. Um, banks were established during slavery to finance the economic and racial system, uh, the, the economic system of racial capitalism. Um, racial capitalism is our economic system that stratifies or it creates difference in economic value based on socially constructed hierarchy. So based on differences around race or gender or economic class. And it's fundamentally an economic system that concentrates power. Um, there's so much more to racial capitalism than, than what I'm talking about today. And you know, we can thank black political thought that really has especially contributed to our understandings on racial capitalism. Um, but, but this is a backdrop of our conversation. So early white owned banks in teamwork with white slaveholders literally collateralized the bodies of, of black peoples who were enslaved um, as credit onto the ledgers of our financial system. Um, white slaveholders surveilled the people that they were brutalizing, they kept detailed records, and then they used those bodies as collateral for amassing wealth for themselves through the financial system. Um, so white surveillance of black bodies and, and human capital are, are part of this early financial system. Uh, the Bank of North America is one of the United States first chartered banks and it was proposed by a slave trader named Robert Morris and established in 1781. Um, and, and this happens at the peak of the transatlantic slave trade. 
Uh, Morris wanted the bank to expand the country's military and to repay revolutionary war debts. Um, so early banks underwrote slavery and invested, um, and invested in militarization. Um, there, are, there are two quotes that stand out to me kind of in illustrating this history. Um, one is from Angela Glover Blackwell and the other is from Alexandra Goodwin. Um, banks are the underwriters of American racism and police are the muscle of capitalism. And so Morris specifically envisioned the Bank of North America to serve these purposes. Um, today, the Bank of North America is known as Wells Fargo. Um, many of the, the banks and the financial institutions, the insurance companies that, are, that have familiar names to us begin their origin stories in slavery. Um, I encourage you to read uh, Carolyn Hussein's Politicized Microfinance or Peter Hudson's Bankers and Empire. Marissa Browder runs The Color of Money and Jeanette Garrett Scott's Banking on Freedom uh, for full more um, exploration of these histories. So these are histories of, of white supremacy and racism and specifically anti-Black racism. Banks as institutions or the gears that turn our financial system have financed redlining and segregation. Um, they rely on credit scoring which is an algorithm that assigns people a score for determining who's worthy of responsible banking. It's a score that assigns difference. Um, black borrowers are disproportionately assigned the lower scores. And, and so that then um, banks can target and exploit them for higher, higher interest loans, um, which pay, you know, which cost more over the term of the loan. Um, though banks kind of set the terms so that they win either way, um, as they still exploit black and brown borrowers um, even when they qualify for loans with better terms. Um, these are all practices that advantage whites. Uh, in the United States, the median household owes about, the median white household owns about 41 times the wealth of the median black household. Uh, racial wealth divides, these are widening and they're growing um, because our financial system and our institutions um, are designed to prioritize and to monetarily value whiteness. Uh, a, a good example of this is uh, from the CARES Act and the PP loans that were distributed. I mean, banks didn't need to do anything differently uh, when they were you know, processing applications for their small business loans. Um, they ended up um, you know, discriminating against and, and not lending to black and other minority owned businesses. Um, but, but simply they did that by, exist by prioritizing their existing customers. Um, so those are, those are part of the gears that are already in place and that are already turning. So financial technologies or FinTech um, uh, cannot save this broken system. Um, it is part of what I argue in the book. Um, financial technologies or FinTech is this broad set of technologies uh, that range from everything to include online and mobile banking to payment systems, crypto cryptocurrencies and artificial intelligence. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna do throughout my talk today is to weave between kind of individual and institutional levels. Uh, so when talking about FinTech, so FinTech that is people facing like online banking um, and FinTech that is institution facing like hedge funds investment algorithms. Uh, and I'm gonna to attempt to kind of blur these lines for us. Um, I'm also gonna associate FinTech with some dynamics that we might not think about uh, when it comes to FinTech. So especially when we focus on FinTech that is people facing, um, we forget that there's this, this whole other kind of range of activities happening um, that, that FinTech is helping to enable. Uh, so through combining kind of research evidence and storytelling, uh, if I've done my job well toward the end, I will have helped us consider kind of the many ways, um, especially FinTech for financial inclusion um, is used kind of as a sleight of hand. So we're offering up FinTech uh, for helping marginalized groups. Um, it is often a guise um, that enables the financial system to continue predatory practices and to concentrate power. Uh, all the while, um, it's making you know, many of the practices like more opaque and even harder for us to see than they already are. Um, so from my vantage point, FinTech operates you know, much more as an enabler of the ways that our financial system and banks and our financial services have already have always operated, um, not necessarily the disruptor in the ways that you know we often hear that word being used. 
So analysis for fintech that, that lacks a critical analysis of, pow, of how power is concentrated, um, of a historical understanding of how anti-Blackness is, is stitched into our financial system is going to un, like vastly underestimate uh, fintech's potential harms uh, to racially marginalized groups. And, and the thing is, this is something that, that we are all kind of collectively harmed by. Um, at the same time, I don't want to like totally discard all of technology. So it's not my intent to like completely throw away everything. Um, I'm really thankful for the technologies that, you know, make it possible for us to talk today and to connect while we're all um, kind of physically distanced. Um, but I began this book because in so many spaces where I was working, think tank spaces, um, academic financial inclusion conversations, policy conversations, um, predominantly white and disproportionately wealthy spaces, uh, there was no critical analysis of fintech. Um, so was, there was no concern about people who didn't have high speed internet access in their homes, which was believed to be a, a small and kind of unimportant group, um, or information and data extraction, or the concentration of wealth, and corporate power, um, or the hyper surveillance of poor white and racially marginalized groups. You know, these um, were really kind of absent from the spaces that I was working in. And so um, my intent was to elevate kind of a critical analyses uh, where they were absent. Um, FinTech is often marketed as a way to promote financial inclusion for marginalized groups. So it's not just marketed, you know, as another way of banking or managing money. It is often specifically advertised, you know, to benefit marginalized groups, um, those for whom have you know, those that have been exploited and marginalized by the, by the financial system for decades. Um, just last week, there was a Senate Banking Committee hearing and Senator Loomis of Wyoming said, I see Bitcoin as a great leveler for people of color and for women. So this idea is a, is a pretty pervasive idea that, that FinTech is, is going to include those that it has historically excluded. Um, and Stuart Levy, the CEO of Facebook, um, or the CEO of Facebook's Diem project, um, said that the company was developing their currency to promote financial inclusion, expanding access to those who need it most. Um, and of course, Facebook is also the same company that's criticized for being a monopoly that violates antitrust laws, um, selling users data, being unable to remove hate speech from its platforms, and discriminating in their online advertising. Um, their, their, their payment systems and their, and their DM currency um, yet is, is going to be able to promote financial inclusion um, in, in some of these really important ways. So I contend that by moving kind of full throttle toward FinTech for financial inclusion, we you know, abandon responsibility and turn over social problems um, to these calculated technologies that are mostly being developed in white wealthy spaces by white engineers who do not have uh, racial justice or anti-racism in mind, and and many who you know just see a very narrow part of the financial system rather than its kind of connections to the rest of the whole. Um, and, and these are technologies that have the potential to make it you know really even harder to discern uh, you know how how wealth and power are being concentrated, um, how black and brown communities are being surveilled in multiple contexts, and, and how data are extracted. Um, so I began my own critical analysis of fintech um, thinking about high speed internet access, which is a really a prerequisite for using any type of fintech. I mean, even smartphones have to be connected to the internet um, because my experience has told me that, that not everyone has high speed internet access. Uh, and there's no way that fintech can solve for financial inclusion uh, when people already exploited and excluded by banks also do not have internet access. Um, these data from a, a few years ago, there's a map of the United States on the screen um, with um, varying deepening colors um, demonstrating different levels of high-speed internet access. Uh, so in, in 2016, um, in the average zip code in the United States, about 50% of households have high-speed internet access in their homes. And this is about half, and uh, this varies across the country, but it's probably lower than we had imagined. Um, and and things likely have changed 
in the few years since these data were collected, but, but perhaps not by much. Um, I wanna zoom into the state of Alabama um, and, and the state of Alabama in particular, you know, has a, has a large rural population, about 41% of Alabama's population lives in rural areas. Alabama's rural counties have high concentrations of black and brown, of black and brown residents. And um, the average kind of high speed internet use in counties in Alabama is, is 29%. Um, so this is, this is different than um, whether or not high speed internet is available. Um, there's, there's more coverage than 29%, but for households that use it, um, it's less than a third of households um, have high speed internet in their home. Um, in the Southwestern part of the state, uh, less than 20% have high speed internet. So it's, so it's even a little bit lower. Um, these same counties in the southwestern part, um, you know, have some counties with populations of 35 to 85 percent of Black residents. And these are the same counties that have lost, you know, significant numbers of their bank branches over the last decade. Um, and I wanted to zoom into Alabama in particular because it bears a lot of similarities to the community where my family lives, where I grew up and my, where my family still lives. Um, so this is a picture of my hometown in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, you're seeing um, a cornfield that's at the end of the growing season, so that so the corn stalks are, are chopped down. There's a kind of like a gravel parking lot there with a, with a car sitting in it. Um, this is a poor, rural, Christian, predominantly white town. Um, the last bank branch that was here closed a few months ago during the pandemic. Uh, the nearest branch is, you know, maybe a 20 or 30 minute drive. And the town is situated in a valley. Um, so there isn't satellite service because it's surrounded by mountains. There's no high speed internet. Um, people still use the equivalent of, of dial up here. Uh, but there is a hill on the top of the town where a farmer has cleared a spot in his cornfield so that people can drive up from the valley, park their car and use their cell phone. Uh, and so this is what mobile banking looked like in, in my community in 2008, um, when I first grabbed this screenshot from, from Google Maps. And so I saw this real disconnect between folks who were saying, you know, FinTech is gonna solve everything and the realities of people's lives and, and people's real uh, material conditions on the ground. Um, this lot has not faded away over time. So even as mobile banking is supposedly, you know, expanding and allowing more people to pay their bills from the comfort of their, you know, kitchen table, um, this parking lot has become an even more permanent fixture uh, in this community. So the only difference now, over a decade later, is that the lot is paved. Um, so this is a picture of the same field, um, different time in the growing cycle. So there are a few uh, young corn stalks, you know, shooting up from the ground in the field. The car is gone, but that, you know, gravel dirt lot is now paved. So while the financial system and technologists have been doubling down on FinTech, um, this community has, has doubled down by paving its hilltop parking lot. Um, the pandemic has made disparate access to high-speed internet you know, much more apparent to us. Um, so we've seen students sitting in school parking lots to access Wi-Fi for their virtual school. Um, we know that states are relying on online portals to schedule vaccine appointments, which is you know, leaving out some of the people who need the vaccine the most. Um, but it, for me, in trying to understand you know, the corporate capitalist business practices that create what we have come to term the digital divide, um, I learned about the works of, of scholars and organizers who are raising some other critiques. So for example, Ruha Benjamin, Chris Gilliard, Twana Petty, uh, Raul Carrillo, Simone Brown, Sophia Noble, Tamara Nopper, and many others um, who were uh, writing about FinTech uh, or writing about technology, um, thinking about data extraction, discriminatory algorithms, hyper surveillance, um, where there are new or different forms of technologies that surveil racially marginalized groups um, who are already targets of surveillance in contexts like policing, housing, and education. Um, so some of this should ring to similarities um, to the history of, of white surveillance and, and white racial violence. Um, I was especially drawn to Chris Gilliard's writings, who has written about digital redlining. Um, 
in the context of education and Tressie McMillan Cottom's writings on black cyber feminism and, and platform capitalism, uh, where she writes about black women's kind of sophisticated uses of technology to, to navigate institutionalized oppressions and, and discrimination. Um, and so not only are we confronted with disparate internet access, um, their works are, are teaching us that we're creating kind of new digital forms of redlining um, and expanding a surveillance state that will be used in more punishing ways uh, towards racially marginalized groups. Um, so I propose that you know, digital redlining kind of occurs at this nexus um, of, of banking and financial technology, uh, requires people to sacrifice their privacy, creates you know, differential costs, increased costs specifically um, for black and brown peoples, um, and you know, manifests from these intentionally, you know, intentional mutually reinforcing policies and practices across multiple actors. So when internet service providers um, decide you know, not to expand into certain communities at the same time that bank branches are closing, um, these are you know, policies and practices across seemingly separate um, industries that, that ultimately raise the costs you know, now internet must be a requirement for virtual schooling or uh, now a smartphone with the, with the right level of, um, you know, upgrades um, and, and the, the software to be able to use mobile banking apps, you know, all of that has costs associated with it. Um, the data that you can download in a given month, um, that, that these things collectively raise the costs of banking. So I'm going to give two examples that illustrate uh, the limitations of fintech, um, which, which I suggest cannot fundamentally change some of these existing power imbalances um, or the concentrated wealth that, that racial capitalism creates. And the first um, example is with student loan debt, which I write about in chapter two, the tyranny, the financialization and the tyranny of bootstraps. Um, financialization refers to this kind of growing uh, growing influence, the rise of finance and kind of its infiltration in, in all different aspects of our lives. Um, and education is supposed to be this, the great equalizer, the, the straps on the backs of our boots that we can pull ourselves up by. Um, the Debt Collective thankfully has been organizing for years around this issue and kind of elevating for us the problems of student loan debt. Um, and that the burdensome amount of student loan debt that people borrow, you know, undermines the, any possibility of bootstrapping with education. The economic definition of debt is, you know, kind of like money that a person owes. So um, we think about it as a negative, but debt also acts out kind of like the ideology of an individual responsibility in response to collective problems. So now we see people being forced to take out, uh, to take out credit card debt, utility debt, medical debt, housing debt, and to, take the financial burdens, uh, the financial responsibility of a global pandemic um, in absence of any sort of sustained public, governmental or collective response. Um, people have been increasingly forced to take responsibility as states have divested um, from institutions of higher education and tuition costs have raised, for example. And so, so students do this in the form of, of student loan debt. Current student loan debt collectively is about $1.7 trillion. This is debt that has risen over time, um, both as you know, a share of total debt and also you know, increased rapidly, rapidly in the amount of debt that people borrow for their educations. And student loan debt is racialized. Um, debt, debt is racialized in a lot of different ways. Um, but generally, um, the average white borrower has paid back most of their debt after about 20 years. Um, and that allows them to be able to convert, you know, student loan payments into wealth, to be able to purchase a home, to save for retirement, um, all the important things in life um, that, that you need that money to do. And that costly student loan payments on a monthly basis prevent you from being able to perform. Um, the average black borrower across the same amount of time, uh, you know, still has, you know, most of their debt, 95% uh, of their debt still, uh, which still needs to be paid. 
Black women hold a disproportionate share of student loan debt. Um, black women borrow an average or at the median about $38,000 for their undergraduate education. And, and this is higher than the about 25 or $26,000 um, across borrowers overall. Now, the part about student loan debt that I wanna raise for us and elevate today has to do with something called uh, asset-backed securities. Um, so the image that I think about, uh, that I think of when I think about securitization um, is this image of, of hay or straw. You know, farmers do not sell straw as individual kind of strands or stocks. They, they bundle them together. Um, and, and this illustrates how banks and lenders convert student loan debt into profits for investors. Um, so by design of the system, investors can earn profits that, that borrowers don't ever see, um, debt that borrowers, especially black and brown borrowers, spend a lifetime repaying. Uh, my colleague, Kristen Seafelt, writes about debt as a form of sharecropping. And so FinTech does not alter this system. Um, it, it makes it operate more efficiently and can help banks to you know, create the conditions so that they're winning and profiting in many different ways. Um, as I mentioned, we think about our debt, our household debt as a negative, um, but for banks on banks balance sheets, debt is a positive, it's an asset, it's a profit. Um, and one of the reasons that debt operates this way for, for banks is because they can sell off that debt to investors. And securitization is the process of bundling individual lines of debt together, kind of under the idea that if we pool everything together, that will reduce risk. Um, and then those bundles can be sold. Uh, most debt is securitized, um, but student loan debt has some unique features and, and that's why I wanna raise it for us today. So student loan debt, um, student loans, they're insured by the federal government. So we uh, you know, publicly support um, student loans and therefore securitization and the asset-backed securities um, that are able to be created from that. 92% of student loans are federally insured and about 80% of student loan asset-backed securities, these, these bundles, um, benefit from government insurance. So this implies that, that federal dollars or public monies are being used to help guarantee the profits um, to banks and to wealthy investors. Um, there are strict bankruptcy laws that make it difficult for borrowers to discharge this debt. Let me see, I think I moved my camera. Yeah. Um, and, and some of this is changing because bankruptcy judges are increasingly realizing that, uh, that monthly student loan payments are, are burdensome and they are hardships. Um, defaulting on student loans comes uh, with consequences. Banks and lenders can report borrowers uh, to credit bureaus for non-payment. Um, they can sue borrowers to compel their payments and they can directly garnish borrowers wages from paychecks um, and from social security checks. So student loan asset backed securities are lucrative in part because their profits to investors are nearly guaranteed um, even when borrowers default. And so unlike other types of securities like mortgage backed securities where wealthier and whiter investors you know, assume a good share of the risk um, student loan asset backed securities shift those burden, uh, you know, onto, onto lenders or onto borrowers. And, uh, and so in part through government insurance, banks and wealthy investors keep the profits while borrowers pay the penalties. Um, the penalties are levied more, more acutely um, onto black and brown borrowers um, because as we've seen, black borrowers take out more uh, more student loans, they repay their debts plus interest over longer periods of time, and they experience comparatively higher default rates. Um, so student loan asset-backed securities generate their profits disproportionately um, from black and brown borrowers' debts for white, whiter and wealthier investors. Uh, what does FinTech have to offer this dynamic? Um, banks and lenders are increasingly using institution-facing FinTech. Um, to enable securitization and investments. Um, so when we think of um, 
you know, when we think of how FinTech can be used um, to help a student loan borrower uh, take out a, a lower interest rate loan or take out a loan from an online lender, uh, we, we miss, you know, that, that FinTech that is people facing. We miss how FinTech is also, you know, enabling wealthy investors to profit offer off of people's pain and people's really costly student loan debt. Um, so FinTech does not change these dynamics. Um, under racial capitalism, I think FinTech can make these dynamics just more precise and more exacting, uh, particularly if we're only focused on one side of the equation. The second example um, is, is the nexus between climate change and Wall Street hedge funds or private equity firms that are buying up homes and properties and apartment complexes uh, and then becoming landlords. So this is chapter four, Corporate Landlords and the Climate Crisis. And this chapter deals with the fact that we are in the Anthropocene or the idea that we have entered the geological epic, epic where um, you know, humans have the, the predominant influence on the earth and human activity is causing catastrophic weather disasters. Um, and, and to talk through this, I'm gonna move us to Lumberton, North Carolina um, because the city of Lumberton was, was devastated from two different hurricanes, one in 2016 and the other in 2018, um, hurricanes Matthew and Florence that both brought uh, record levels of, of flooding. Um, and so, you know, much of our, our housing development, our zoning laws, our, our floodplains, our insurance policies, um, these have all been developed around weather disasters from the last few decades or from the data that we had previously that we've collected. Um, but regions of the country like Lumberton um, are increasingly seeing 500 year and 1000 year weather events every few years. Um, so we're not, our models and our society generally is not really organized for the future um, the climate change is bringing. But in 2016, Hurricane Matthew brought, brought significant flooding to Lumberton and there was a technical report um, commissioned by the city that, uh, that found that if the town built floodgates to close a gap created by a railroad underpass that exposed the town to the river, um, that, that this would reduce flooding. Um, CSX, unfortunately, owned the railroad tracks running beneath this underpass, and they refused to allow the floodgates to be built. So the flood, floodgates did not get built. Um, I should say at this point that 37% of Lumberton's residents are Black, 13% uh, are Native, and 10% are Latino, and the remainder uh, the remaining 39% are white. Um, about 36% of, of Lumberton residents have incomes that are below the poverty line. So in 2018, um, Hurricane Florence was approaching and the town wanted to build sandbag walls in the location where the floodgates should have been. Um, and again, CSX repeatedly like denied these requests and they would not allow the, the sandbag walls to be built. Um, and they threatened lawsuits for people who trespassed and tried to build them. Um, but eventually the governor signed an executive order have allowing this to happen. Um, but you know, this approval came late. It came when the hurricane was just a few hours away um, and Lumberton was flooded again um, by Hurricane Florence. And again, it was estimated that 80% of the flooding would have been reduced or eliminated had the floodgates been built. Um, so we can see, you know, folks in Lumberton who are, you know, scrambling at the last minute to build um, some of this, you know, some of the sandbag wall um, that that ultimately caved and and flooded most of the town. Now uh, we know that our built environment is not random. Um, so people across racial groups do not have equal access of experiencing the, the consequences of extreme weather and that, and that devastation. So redlining, segregation, ongoing discriminatory lending and, and real estate practices enable white people to buy a greater distance between themselves and this extreme weather that's happening. Um, and in fact, there's, there's evidence suggesting that white households gain wealth um, when after weather disasters have occurred. Um, in part through the FEMA aid that's funneled into those communities. Um, on average between 1999 and 2013, white households had gained an average about, of about $126,000 in wealth um, 
in communities that has had experienced devastation. And of course, this is in contrast to the wealth lost by black and brown households in those same places. So black and brown peoples disproportionately bear the burdens of environmental hazards, of weather disasters, and in Lumberton, black and brown residents were displaced from their homes at a rate that was three to six times greater than that of white residents. Um, the Lumberton rental market shrunk by about 25%. Um, and so at the same time that climate change is happening, weather disasters are happening, um, Wall Street investors like hedge funds, private equity firm, banks, they have been you know, buying up properties, properties that were foreclosed during the Great Recession, properties that have been damaged or devalued. And, and while this example in Lumberton is focused in the United States, this is really a global concern. There was a Florida-based investment company called Timeout Communities that had been buying up properties in Lumberton that were damaged by the first hurricane, Hurricane Matthew. Um, and then they began opening mobile home parks for residents that had been displaced. Um, Timeout Communities owns 19 mobile home parks in Lumberton, uh, and they have about 1,200 lots. So after the hurricane, after Hurricane Florence, um, Timeout's mobile home parks again received more residents who were displaced. Um, and then the corporation started raising rents. Um, so residents, disproportionately black and brown residents, having recently been displaced, some by multiple hurricanes, sought housing in these mobile home parks um, that had become a replacement for the, for the housing stock that was lost um, through the damage. But some residents saw their monthly rents triple when timeout communities began raising these rents. Um, residents who complained received eviction notices and were, and were evicted. Um, and so, uh, so then timeout communities began evicting and creating additional housing precarity um, for those who are living in Lumberton. And so as a renter, um, to whom do you appeal for justice when your landlord is a private equity firm or a hedge fund? And, and what does FinTech have to offer this dynamic? Um, so private hedge funds and equity firms are, are also increasingly using FinTech like algorithms and artificial intelligence to identify profitable investment opportunities, um, including foreclosed homes, including apartment complexes, and including in distressed markets. Um, so FinTech helps, in these cases, wealthy investors profit off of disasters and people's devastation. Um, while, while private equity is using FinTech to concentrate wealth and power on one side, our policy responses to the people of Lumberton um, tend to be, um, you know, using the people facing FinTech, tend to be things like a financial education class, or an app that manages income flows, um, or as Senator Loomis suggested, uh, to invest in Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency that's also being critiqued for its potentially harmful uh, environmental impacts, including energy consumption. So I'm being a little facetious here because I don't know of an example of where, uh, you know, a, someone, you know, sought out the residents of Lumberton and offered them a financial education class, but I also would not be surprised to learn if that happened. Um, and so our responses, you know, often really miss the level um, of, of real need um, and, and the real lived experiences um, of, of people on the ground. And so I hope we, you know, can realize how extremely inadequate and even absurd um, some of those responses can be um, to the residents of Lumberton or the residents of Texas who just recently experienced their own extreme weather um, or residents of Jackson, Mississippi or Flint, Michigan who still do not have clean water in their homes. Um, timeout communities in Lumberton is a microcosm of what's happening across the country. So this is not the only example. Um, and, and there are a number of examples uh, across the country and worldwide. Um, just like uh, securitization helps bundle student loan debt and, and sell that debt for profit. Um, corporate landlords come in and scoop up properties and, and housing in bulk. Um, we're already seeing reports that, that corporate or Wall Street landlords are, are poised to profit from the current crises where we're expecting uh, mass evictions and foreclosures. Um, and so as a result of the climate change induced global pandemic and, and a limited government response, people can't pay their mortgages, banks and lenders will foreclose on homes, 
private equity you know, can buy up those properties in bulk, manage them as rentals, and, and then possibly create the conditions to institutionalize housing precarity uh, on, a, on a really enormous scale. Um, so I want us to consider the ways that, that FinTech can be complicit in this, especially as our weather disasters uh, become more frequent and, and they get worse. Um, individualizing FinTech to focus on mobile banking or you know, a life hack for managing income flows, we can overlook how FinTech may be helping to concentrate power in these other ways and may even be kind of directly contributing to some of these environmental harms. Um, and again, when I you know, first approached this topic, I was thinking of a very kind of person facing you know, idea or notion of FinTech um, and also you know, specifically thinking about things like high-speed internet access. Um, but there, there is much else um, to be aware of I think, uh, within the realm of fintech. Um, I think when we sanction fintech for things like mobile banking, um, I worry that we are also inadvertently giving implicit permission kind of for the rest of fintech. Uh, and our language, like the common definition of fintech, is defined as a set of technologies. So, so the language around fintech that we use indicates you know, this potential to flatten and to lump together. Um, and, and I, think, um, I think some of that should be, should be concerning. And, and this is the sleight of hand, um, how promises of financial inclusion for racially marginalized groups are proffered up uh, as, as you know, this potential positive. Um, and, and understanding these individual critiques, I think help us peer into the rest of the ways that the financial system can use FinTech to stack the deck. Um, we're also led to believe sometimes that the expansion of fintech is inevitable um, and that we should accept this inevitability. Uh, and in this process, perhaps you know, we forget or, or we allow ourselves to forget um, or to look away from you know, some of the harms that fintech can cause. Um, and so while the examples that I have shared may sound dire, I actually think that there's a good bit of hope um, that our financial system like, can indeed operate differently. Um, FinTech won't bring about you know, the, the types of changes or revolutions that are really needed to make banking more inclusive or more equitable. Um, but there are groups of people who are working to transform the system in some really beautiful ways. And so public banking uh, is a movement that, that I think is pretty exciting and is happening right now. And I write about this in the book's concluding chapter. Uh, Native and, and indigenous communities for a long time have advocated um, for divesting from environmentally harmful development projects, um, from, from pooling money um, out of banks that finance things like the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, as, as one example that's been really relatively prominent in the news. Um, but there are uh, you know, 34 and growing public banking movements um, across the United States uh, where public banking coalitions are active, they're expanding, they are passing legislation uh, to make public banks possible. Um, I've learned a good bit from my colleague Amaya Pawar uh, that, that public banking legislation um, would allow about five trillion public dollars. So, so collectively, states and local governments have about five trillion public dollars um, from pension funds, from tax revenues invested in private banks that could be pooled out and located in, in a public bank um, that returns money to communities, returns the profits to communities instead of you know, private banks, wealthy shareholders. So I think these movements are demonstrating that our institutions are not intractable. They don't have to be enduring. Um, and this is the message that I wanna end on, um, that these people led movements with anti-racism, with justice, with equity at their core, um, movements that are questioning the concentrations of power uh, and the concentrations of wealth, um, that are concerned about hyper surveillance, rooting out anti black racism, um, and the turning over of our public lives to private banks and proprietary algorithms. So, I think um, movements of people uh, can help us imagine and, and realize the different financial and economic futures that are, that are possible. Um, technology is often like positioned as futurist, but it isn't inherently so just because it's, you know, we often see it prominently depicted in, in 
sci-fi genre or in our own imaginations of the future. Um, it's not necessarily futurist from an understanding of uh, a future as space and time. Um, technology is something that can exist in that space and time. Um, but financial technologies that exact kind of old harms in new ways do not have to be an inevitable part of our financial system moving forward into the future. Uh, and I think people-led movements can help us um, really understand the contours of time and space, time and space, and, and what we might want to exist there, um, and see that there are other kind of better ways of organizing our, our financial system and of, of building more equitable financial futures. So um, with that, that's the conclusion of my talk. Um, thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Justin for questions. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, that was great. Um, and if, if people um, in the audience have any questions, you can either message me privately or uh, I think there's like a little hand raising tool on Zoom and you can do that and I'll just um, call on you and then read your question. Um, but to start off, we, we had a couple of questions um, about initiatives that um, are black owned or social justice oriented um, that are trying to use FinTech for good. Um, um, one mentioned was Greenwood, which I'm not sure if you've heard of that, I'm not sure what that is. But um, so yeah, so just kind of like maybe general thoughts on like those initiatives and, and how we might think about um, some of those things. You know, I, I know there's like some of the, the big companies that will dive into that. Um, you know, in Detroit, I'm familiar with some of the organizations that use that type of language, but to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a good question because um, it's easy to um, create kind of firm, categorized dichotomizations, you know, about like good and bad. Um, and I think there are some really good examples. Um, and, I, and I'm, I'm slightly familiar with Greenwood, um, but examples where you know people are working to um, move the financial system in a different way, and and some of that is fintech based, and and I think those efforts um, that are rooted in ideas of a more equitable, a more a more fair and a more just system are part of the steps. Um, along a path to a financial system um, that is better than the one that we currently have. Right? So, um, so if we think about you know, a long continuum of, of change in the financial system, um, there are all these little steps happening, I think, that are, that are pushing it, um, pushing to make it a little bit better, a little bit different, a little bit more equitable. And FinTech is involved um, in some of those steps. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, those examples of FinTech um, are hopeful um, and important and useful and, and that we want to learn from them um, while simultaneously knowing that there is this whole other um, FinTech that, that, that may be trying to do something different. Um, and so, so how do we not let that kind of undermine um, the, the good work that, um, that those groups are doing? I hope that gives justice to the question. Yeah, thank you. I, and then kind of a, a related question I have here. Um, and the question is about, um, the, the question is about kind of uh, financial institutions and, and um, and others kind of adopting language about structural change and about like changing the system um, and how we might like, um, and how like, I, I know your background is as a social worker um, and, and how like social workers might like try to engage with that um, or how like social workers might better engage with financial conversations um, and, and conversations about financial systems. Um. Well, I, I would love to talk with other social workers who are interested in thinking about that. Um, I, you know, it, it's not an area um, where we think there are many social workers working. Uh, I think we might underestimate um, the presence of, of organizers and activists um, and, and 
folks who are social work aligned um, doing this work. I, I think um, institutions and our financial and economic systems in some ways are intentionally opaque, that it seems like it's hard to figure out. Um, and, and I learn myself new things every day about how it works. Um, and so, uh, so I encourage you, you know, if you, if you relate to that at all, not, not quite sure where to jump in, that, that these are things that you can learn, right, that, that I have learned about, um, and that there are likely people working around you um, that would want to learn about them too. I do not take at face value in institutions kind of statements about, you know, kind of structural changes. Um, I would like to see, you know, to see the evidence uh, to where, where those are being implemented um, of our large banks and lenders that, you know, have made statements about Black Lives Matter and um, that are, that are, that have funded a lot of financial inclusion work, you know, while simultaneously um, engaging in discriminatory lending. So uh, I, I would like to see their, I would like to see their proof. Yeah, um, cool, thank you. Um, I think we have one time, uh, time for one more question. Um, and it's kind of like a, a, a two part here. So um, it's just about like international efforts, um, some in international development, some with other countries um, and, and things that are happening with FinTech. So it's kind of a two part question. One is like, have you seen other countries that maybe are getting um, financial empowerment, financial inclusion, right? In terms of policy. Um, and then the other one um, that's related is, what, what do you think of some of the FinTech stuff happening in international development, like M-Pesa in Africa or the tech-enabled micro-lending? I mean, are those having a serious empowering impact or not? That's a great question. And there's um, kind of a lot to untangle, I think, uh, in different places that have different, you know, political and economic and cultural contexts. Um, for example, you know, there was, there was good hope uh, a few years ago about like kind of micro lending and empowering women in particular um, in, the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Carolyn Hussein's book, Politicized Microfinance is a, is a great, um, great resource for that. Um, uh, we also have seen countries with kind of different sorts of infrastructures. So for the most part, we have a fairly widespread bank branch network with gaps and holes, but it exists kind of across the country, um, which is not the case um, in many countries that have stood up kind of mobile banking as an infrastructure um, for their banking system. Um, and we also see reports, you know, every now and then about the difficulties of financializing and, and introducing finance um, in a way that didn't exist previously and that there, you know, are some associated harms possibly with that. Cool, thank you. Um, all right, I think we're, we're, we're at time. Um, I will say thank you um, on behalf of the Center on Finance Law and Policy. This was um, so interesting. I, I wish we could keep talking for a while. <laughs> so I may email Sorry, you and I see think if I talked too long. Yeah, I talked too long. No, no, th this is great. I just, I, you know, I wish there was more conversations like this happening. Um, in communities and, and at the university. So I'm so glad that this happened today. Um, so, but thank you for everyone and, and check out Terry's book. Um, I've, I've read it, it's fantastic. Um, and, and thank everybody for attending today's event. Um, you can check out our upcoming events at financelawpolicy.umich.edu. Um, our next month's blue uh, bag talk is called um, The Myth of the Millionaire Mindset, Experimental Evidence from Filipino Entrepreneurs. Um, that will be April 1st, um, April 1st from noon to one. Again, this is a virtual event and that will be um, Dean Yang, who's a professor of public policy and economics. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Professor Friedlein. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you all.